It's time to pitch. Are, are our founders ready? Excellent. All right, don't everybody get too excited all at one time. So what's gonna happen now is uh, each of the founders is gonna get 10 minutes to pitch. Um, I'll, I'll uh, hopefully you've got a, a clock and you'll be able to keep your own time, but I'll also be sitting there keeping time for you and uh, trying to give you a, the high sign when it's, when it's time to wrap up and be done. The first pitch is gonna be AccuStitch, um, Dr. John Menendez. Please welcome Dr. Menendez. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be invited here by this group of investors and this final round of Angel Envy 2022. AccuStitch provides fast, consistent, easy to use suturing systems, which increase productivity. The problem is manual suturing of long incisions. Uh, myself, other plastic surgeons have lamented amongst ourselves, why isn't there a sewing machine for skin yet? That's because at the end of a case, when we're closing long incisions, it's tedious, it's repetitive manual labor that we'd like to alleviate through mechanization. For very long incisions, that, that can take up to 30 to 60 minutes of case time. And that results in potential exposures to infection through longer open wounds for the patient, uh, but also greater availability and skill and execution, because when you're talking about a hand-sewn technique, the, it's highly surgeon dependent. And so we could standardize it by mechanizing it. Also, there are a lot of surgeons who like to hand this off to PAs and NPs, physician extenders who are slower than the standard surgeon. And of course, for the hospital system, time equals money, at which uh, point at a minimum, $3,000 an hour is what it costs to do a level one case in an OR. So saving time saves money. This presents an opportunity for improvement, at least where all suturing is required. And this can occur at multiple layers, skin, subcutaneous tissue, fascia, intra-abdominally with laparoscopic and robotic techniques as well. A sewing machine for tissue would improve on the hand-driven technique. Our solution is an automated needle driver. We believe this has not existed before because it requires 3D microprinting to establish a needle that can be controlled in the way it needs to be controlled. But once we have micro 3D printing, we create a geared 3D printed needle and suture packet that's driven by a programmable multiple stitch pattern uh, console for multiple applications. This results in a two to four times speed advantage over the manual technique, more repeatable results, so more less variability between patients and a lowering learning curve for NPs and PAs who might not be as skilled as a highly trained surgeon. We were patented in 2020 and we've already begun international patent uh, protection process this April. Well, I'm gonna focus in terms of the uh, business model on the long incision market, because that's what we've really researched. We also recognize there's application in laparoscopic and robotics, as well as ERs and military combat support hospitals. And we're initiating talks with the DOD in that regard. To prove this out, we did a, a quick suturing study where we did training media and sutures and myself, a chief resident, an OR tech versus uh, John, the engineer who has no skill at suturing at all, never been trained. He was twice as fast as me and four times as fast as the OR tech. And he also uh, sutured in a more regular pattern. In terms of the market opportunity, the TAM, SAM and SOM are as follows. 1.5 billion in suture sales annually, just in the US, 50 million procedures. The SAM is 500 million spread across 7 million procedures, which we've calculated to be conservatively the, the 10 centimeter and longer incisions. And if, as we gain market share one to eight to 25%, you see that the business becomes $100 million a year in revenue. That's based on this business, business model and sample analysis. On the left are the input assumptions, on the right, the output financials, looking at long incisions, those greater than 10 centimeters, market penetration of uh, 20%, and with the suturing rates, you get a revenue of 167 million, a profit of 67 million, and a hospital savings in terms of OR time dollars saved of almost 200 million. And that's because spread across 7 million long incisions, that's 600 miles of suturing that needs to be performed, 1 million man hours, and 3 billion in OR time that could be saved. Of course, we can't ignore the laparoscopic market because it has grown since 2000 and replaced a lot of open procedures, 14 million globally, 5 million in the US. $14 billion and continues to grow. And there's a certain advantage to this market segment in that it tolerates higher margins, uh, more expensive equipment because the uh, outcomes are better. And that's similar in robotic surgery, which has increased from two to 15% across the nation and is now more than half of US installations and more than a million procedures per year. 
That being said, recent studies show that it's actually slower than laparos laparoscopy and considerably more expensive. So where's the real advantage? AccuStitch could add to this market by adding speed and improving the ability to suture intraabdominally. Our competition is meager. We believe that we are a market disruptor. Direct competition only really includes Sutru, a company in England that has produced a similar device, but never brought it to market in 10 years. We believe this is because it's mechanically inferior. It uses a complex gear and friction mechanism using standard needles, which we can bend, uh, and, and they haven't achieved any traction. Indirect, the subcuticular staples that dissolve are not widely adopted. Only 8% of the C-section market really and hasn't grown much in the last five years, not widely used by surgeons. And then of course, people have asked about staples, skin glues, steri strips. Those are really just for the super, most superficial layer of closure and do not compete with AccuStitch. They could still be used as an adjunct after you sew the deeper layers with AccuStitch. The AccuStitch value, so we bring a device that can automate suturing, speeds closure, offers multiple suture patterns, lowers the learning curve for physician assistance, and the needle itself is stronger, 40% resist bending compared to standard needles, and can be applied to both open and laparoscopic techniques. The only thing close to it is uh, a proxisure offered by Ethicon, and that's still just a manual, you actually pump it with your hand to, to drive the needle, and uh, there is no mechanized solution as yet. Our business model is basically the razor and razor blades model. So we have the $2,500 reusable autoclavable drive, which is attached to a computer console that's programmable. And it's gonna drive sales of the single use suture and needles, which are, we estimate to be approximately $40, but could decrease with volume. We aren't ignoring the laparoscopic market, even though we're focusing on long incisions at the moment. Our engineer did produce a smaller needle and drive head, 82% of our MVP one, to prove that it could fit in a 15 millimeter laparoscopic port. And we um, have recently done provisional patent work on that as well. Our intent is to bring this, not, not necessarily to bring it to market completely ourselves. We'd like to have a shorter path to exit and talk to one of the big companies that already have a sales force and uh, a market. Uh, but if that can't be achieved, then we would seek full commercialization. The team is myself, a 20 year plastic surgeon here in Las Vegas, academic the entire time. I trained at USC and Johns Hopkins and have been interested in innovation for the last few years. John Penn is our co-founder and lead engineer who has more than 35 years of experience in engineering and device development at Davis and Geck, Becton Dickinson and Cope Laboratories. And Tony Clinch is a business partner and technology advisor who's the head of advisory board. He also has more than 35 years of experience as executive VP of R&D Healthcare at 3M. Our advisory board is replete with uh, business and legal veterans, including intellectual property, corporate law, regulatory affairs for FDA, accounting, and we are part of the UCF, University of Central Florida Business Incubation Program. As we've developed, we've established an ecosystem of suppliers and technology partners that have helped us develop the device. And our spending forecast for the next two years, which brings us up to pre-FDA submission, will take approximately half a million dollars, the majority of which is engineering. This is a video just demonstrating our MVP one using the crudest uh, 3D printed components from GE. John loading the needle, zeroing it, clockwise and counterclockwise cycling. It's always controlled at two points by multiple uh, gear heads. It's never free of the device, driving it through fairly tough tissues. Here he is uh, suturing in the media I was talking about. You can see how facile it is for someone with no training in suturing. And he, here he's demonstrating another suture pattern subcuticular where it's programmed to offer a double pointed needle that sews in two directions, reversible for below the skin sewing. This is the first run GE, which demonstrated in an MVP one. It has a relatively rough surface. We've since improved by talking with other 3D micro manufacturers that have five times the resolution and come up with better designs for the needle itself that may offer more reliability. This is uh, JP, the latest demo with our battery driven version. So there is a cheaper version that could come out and be handheld and battery driven for use in ERs and uh, cash units. So in summary, AccuStitch offers a faster wound repair, a more consistent repair, a faster learning curve and expandable platform. We're asking for approximately 500K, majority of which we're gonna need for engineering. Thank you. If any of the investors would like to see, uh, John did mail me uh, our prototype, so you could have some hands on. Okay, thank you. So up next, Jackie Mork from 
Carrot. So welcome, Jackie. Jackie's got a cheering set. <laughs> I'll put it here so that they can hear, but I'm mostly going to talk here. That's okay. Hi, I'm Jackie, co-founder and COO of Carrot. <sighs> wow. It's first of all, just really great to be able to be in front of a live audience again. Um, it's also really great just to know that all of you have pants on. <laughs> I joke, mostly to break the ice. We got a Saturday in here today. Um, but in all seriousness, these last few years have been really hard. And when COVID hit, it forced us to separate. It forced us to step out of our lives and out of the relationships that we have within our communities. And uh, at first it was pretty novel. We shared memes, we tried new hobbies, we watched all of the shows, and we had everything that our heart could desire conveniently and efficiently dropped on our doorstep. Until it wasn't. When the loneliness set in, we realized that at the heart of human connection is the desire for us all to be able to connect. We woke up to the fact that we missed connecting with people in our life that create value. And we missed bringing value to those around us every single day. Siloed away, COVID won, and we lost. But there was one champion that did rise undefeated during COVID. And you all know who that is, e-commerce. <laughs> Ecom hit a tipping point during the pandemic. It forced us to change our perspective. Ecom was no longer a luxury. E-commerce became a necessity. And now after, we are not willing to give up that convenience, but we still crave that connection. So the solution is right in front of us. If we can access services that meet our needs right here within our local communities, then we can serve both goals. But as last year proved with over 159 million square feet, of retail space shuttering, local businesses are not able to meet us where we are at. And with the increasing, the impending recession, businesses that can prioritize both personalization and convenience will have the best chance to survive. And that is where Carrot comes in. We turned, thank you, we turned current systems on their head and design Carrot to act as a white label platform to give non-tech savvy retailers the ability to offer an experience that customers expect today. When we scale Carrot, what we are doing is spreading connections. We are giving local businesses the ability to handle volume while offering a personalized high touch experience at scale globally. But first, we have to stay focused. Cannabis is where we've started. Cannabis is probably the most personal business out there. And while the culture of cannabis is personal, current customer touch points are not. Up until now, generic systems and marketplaces have dictated what a business can do. Instead, Carrot is a flexible system that puts retailers in control of their entire customer experience. Carrot creates a streamlined platform that replacing disconnected tools. Alongside a dispensary's point of sale, a retail operator has everything they need to seamlessly run their store while standing out amongst competition all while reducing strain on their operation. At the end of this presentation, I am going to give you information on how you can see Carrot live right here in fabulous Las Vegas. 
But first, let's dive into the business model and traction. Carrot uses a utility-based pricing model where order fees are added to subtotals and passed on to customers, similar to how service fees are added to your food delivery apps. There is a $1 service fee for pickup, curbside, and drive through and a $3 service fee for delivery. That makes our average monthly recurring revenue $2,500 per location. Last year, we got the ball rolling with eight paid dispensaries. But this year is when we unlocked our go-to-market, strategic partnerships with point of sales. Using this method, we, in a mere six weeks, we've been able to sign 10 new contracts for an additional $25,000 in monthly revenue with many more on the way. So let's look at the next few years. As of 2021, our total market is 10,000 dispensaries nationally worth 2.4 billion. Our serviceable market is 4,500 dispensaries based on our current point of sale integrations worth 1 billion. Now, our plan of attack is to partner with our point of sale integrations. And using this method, we will capture 1,400 dispensaries that are going to uh, put us on track for $42 million in annual recurring revenue by the end of 2025. So let's talk about competition. Current competitors focus on transactional sales, leaving it up to the operator to figure out how they're gonna manage increased workflows. As the cannabis market becomes increasingly more competitive, focusing on securing these transactions just isn't gonna cut it. So Carrot was designed to bring efficiency to every single customer touch point. The result? is that we are able to provide both personalization and convenience where our competitors are unable to offer both. Okay, we've bitten off a pretty big endeavor. So what makes us the ones to do it? First, our team has worked together for over six years. Second, we are seasoned in fast paced, high growth tech environments. And third, we have the industry expertise to boot. So let's talk about the ask. $500,000 to take Carrot National. But that's just the beginning because cannabis is the launching pad to retailers globally. Because with Carrot, local businesses are finally able to meet the demands of the modern retail operator. It has been a pleasure to introduce you to Carrot. High touch, high volume, personalization at scale. Thank you. You can go on this website right now and place a weed order for delivery if you want. Oh, no. <laughs> I thought the pitches were pretty entertaining. I didn't think we needed uh, more entertainment. So. Thank you, Jackie. Always great to hear you speak. Um, so next, next up is Ed Nebraski from CID. Ed, come on up and take it away. Oh, it's tough to follow that. I'm going to see everyone's heads down getting their weed orders in while we're speaking here. <laughs> yes, we're CID, and uh, we're excited to be here in front of you and uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, we have a great management team. Uh, I've managed four other startups to exit and this is the best management team I've ever had. Uh, experts in the industry, people that have deep experience and a pleasure to work with. We also have a great advisory board. I wish I could spend time in introducing each one to you, but I just wanted to get a sense of their qualifications and how they've helped us get as far as we are already. Uh, again, in all the startups I've managed, uh, we've never had such a good start. And I'll explain that a little bit more to you. So what is CID targeting? We're after two specific industries. One, uh, the DOD, and uh, specifically we've started munitions and material tracking in the DOD because of an opportunity that's there right now in front of us that we're in a great position to capture. Secondly, we're after industrial material handling and logistics. Uh, there's a, a very wide market there. Uh, when you have TAMs that are in the trillions, you know you're tackling a very big established market. 
It's a market I've spent most of my career in, as have some of my partners and co-founders. And so we know that market well, but it's a market in transition, a market moving to IoT, where there's an opportunity to do a lot of new digitization systems that haven't existed before. We're tackling that. Right in front of us, uh, if we go down to the SOM, that $86 million number is what's immediately capturable by us. That obtainable market is something that's in front of us and in our pipeline. Uh, we've gathered about $300,000 in purchase orders already. We're working through our POCs in that direction and are installing uh, some of our systems even right now, uh, this month as we perform. Uh, many of those initial POCs are leading to about $3.5 million in business in that immediate future. Now, this is what our pipeline looks like. So we have a number of very interesting companies, uh, including ones here right here locally in Nevada, where we're headquartered here in Las Vegas, um, with Las Vegas paving leading the way, uh, Nellis Air Force Base uh, here close by, and a number of Caterpillar locations uh, being some of our key customers. Uh, I've been very impressed as we built this enterprise, the relationships we've been able to form in a very short period of time, the value we've been able to demonstrate to their management teams, and how well our PLCs are starting to, uh, to progress. Uh, but we have a very strong pipeline and a very good um, start as we begin this year. Let me explain a little bit better for you. Uh, let's start with the military opportunity. One of the things that brought us together as co-founders was this opportunity within the Air Force specifically. Uh, they'd installed a new backend system called TICMS to replace a lot of legacy software that had driven the Air Force munitions operations for many years. Uh, TICMS was designed to do that backend work, but it was designed knowing there would be other plug-in modules that would be needed. And specifically, one of the modules that they needed was this kind of tracking and visibility module that we plugged in underneath, a visibility that they didn't have and still don't have. Uh, we've been working over the last year and a half uh, with this branch of the military to plug into TICMS and to learn how to do that. And some of our early POCs and SBIRs that we've been awarded have been uh, in line with that. So we believe we're currently in the driver's seat to take that market and to be that new plug-in for visibility underneath TICMS to move munitions around. It starts with trailer tracking. It starts with doing some of the munitions tracking within their ammo bunkers. Um, but it's a, a very interesting use case to modernize our military and be able to move them forward. This um, process applies very much to industry as well. Our industrial customers like FedEx and CAT have the same kinds of problems, tracking material, tracking trailers, tracking equipment, and being able to move them from place to place. Using IoT techniques to have these pieces of equipment talk to each other, to have the assets talk to each other, enables a new way of digitizing the enterprise saving tremendous amounts of money and saving a lot in their labor costs as well. I'll explain that a little bit to you, but there's three key things, and, and I wish we had the time to go into each one of these, but material handling, of course, uh, pick, pack, and put type operations, inventory operations, cycling containers, a vast market happening across many, many different enterprises. Equipment tracking, like lift tools, lift trucks, heavy equipment and trailers, um, and then HSC, health, safety, and environmental applications. We do a lot of collision avoidance, muster and duress, and, and safety and security and geofencing with our technology. So in those broad buckets, I hope you can think a little bit about it. But let me give you an example. Uh, just last week, it was fantastic because we were meeting with the owners of LVP, and we were talking about our system. We've installed 15 of their vehicles and have been in a POC for a number of months with them, uh, proving the value of the system. And it's great when you're trying to sign a $5 million contract that they have a big accident right when you're sitting at the table. And uh, they did that last week. One of the tires blew on this trailer that you can see, a fire started. It only burned the tire. Uh, they lost the load of $12,000 worth of material in the, in the trailer, as well as had to buy a new trailer in the end. Now, some of that the insurance was able to cover, but the tremendous cost of this, just for the want of the tracking of a tire pressure sensor, is tremendous on an organization like LVP that has over 4,000 pieces of equipment on the road in any given day. So our system uh, with IoT sensors on those tire lugs gives us a chance to prevent these kinds of accidents. When you think about that across LVP, you think across Caterpillar and all their dealerships, across the military and all the equipment they're running, it's a tremendous market and an opportunity we've proven we can handle. How does this work? Well, uh, it's a, a fantastic organization of components. Again, that we don't have time to go into every piece of it, but fundamentally we're a, a, a infrastructureless system. If I can go back. Um, what we call zero infrastructure. You see a mesh network of IoT sensors or devices that talk to each other. They talk to each other in a specific way, an encrypted paradigm using um, elliptical curve cryptography and a little bit of multiplexing of the, of the frame that we have to be able to pass these along. We have patent pending on this operation. We also have a patent already granted on our overall system approach and another patent that's pending on a new chip that we'd like to develop to make this an even more efficient process. Behind that uh, infrastructure system, when we say infrastructure, this means we don't need new towers. We don't need to put up a lot of antennas. Um, we really run from the base markers that are there. 
And then of course we have software in the cloud and on handheld devices. The fact that we don't have to put up portals, special receivers, run power to these sites, that we can operate wide like an LVP mine or construction site, enables us to do things that other vendors can't do. And that's really our core advantage. The fact that we can secure it in an immutable array of cooperative markers is also tremendously important and differentiating. So this is where our technology base is found in. Um, and I show these advantages here. In addition to those, um, we have a, a concept for long range 5G chips. We won't talk about that too much more. I've got a couple slides on it. Um, the zero infrastructure technology we've discussed. And of course, we also have some great expertise in federal contracting. Uh, we have an established contract vehicle that allows us to sole source up to $100 million contracts. We've already leveraged that for a couple of our POC contracts that we have. So we're organized and ready to move uh, in that sector in particular. We do have competitors, none of which have all the advantages that we have, um, and we're certainly trying to maneuver around them now as we work through the different um, procedures. But uh, one of the big advantages that we have is that this entire system is conceived, patented, and worked on here in the United States. And for our government, government business, that puts us fairly unique amongst this competitive field. That's allowed us to go after another opportunity in the chip that we'll talk about next. Um, but our sales process is very similar to other SaaS companies that you may know about. It's a recurring revenue model. We make about 50% on our hardware, 65% uh, 60 on our services, and then about 95% on our software. Those are bundled together and we have an opportunity then to earn uh, ongoing revenue in our subscription model. Uh, we have a deep intimate customer relationship model, whether it's with CAT or LVP or or our military business where we do one install, we solve one problem, we innovate and take our technology to solve another problem and we cycle back again through that sales cycle. So we expect our relationships with our customers to last many years, constantly innovating and bringing our concept through different processes in their enterprise. And that's the way that we build up revenue and ARR over time. So the unique opportunity we have is to build this chip we've talked about, a 5G edge chip. Our unique protocol has an opportunity to replicate through a modulating process from chip to chip upon the assets. There's really not much research being done in this. It's a personal area of study of mine and a place that we patented. This allows us to very inexpensively, with no batteries, no infrastructure, take a record of all the inventory in a given place, especially applicable to places where inventory sits for a long period of time, like laydown yards, munitions dumps, and some of the enterprises that we work with. Um, this unique product opportunity is, is really key now because we have a government willing to fund uh, US-based chip manufacture. And so we've already been working with our, our um, advisory board, some of our lobbyists, some interesting local politicians to get ourselves positioned to get some of that non-dilutive cash to develop this particular chip system. Uh, we hope to be able to do this in parallel to our main system development and in doing that really enhance the value, the exit valuation of our company. So return on investment of where we look at it. Uh, right now, we wanted to do about a $1 million seed round. We're already oversubscribed on that round, having uh, gathered more than 1.2 million now. Uh, we hope to close it uh, really with this event. We wanted to stay open so we could, we could be part of this organization. Uh, we expect an A round to happen in about 18 months, the end of 2023, um, as we, uh, we grow and we scale. In that time period, we hope to be able to gather up some of those early contracts from the POCs that we have and have a significant valuation of about $30 million by the time that A round happens. If all those things happen uh, with the discount we're giving, 25% uh, discount on investments over 100,000, uh, your seed investors will be well positioned for an exit event down the road for up to 48 times their initial investment. Our allocation of the funds from this seed round really come into our uh, engineering product development. Uh, we're spending a lot right now on building up that team and have a great start on the initial software architecture and some of the hardware components. So thank you for that very quick tour through CID. There's so much we could tell you uh, more about this, but it's a fantastic opportunity where we have a great start and we're looking forward to working together with you going forward. Thank you. So you can see that all of these startups are very competitive with one another. So thanks very much, Ed. Um, next up, Elton Rivas from Semi-Exact. So Elton, come on down. You saying we're so competitive, I feel like I should like say something strong. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks everybody for having us here today. My name is Elton, uh, my co-founder and co-CEO Matt is here with me as well today. And I'm here to introduce Semi-Exact, our company. And our company Semi-Exact is here with a simple mission to empower the world to say, I made it. And we're doing that with our own factory, 
We're doing that with proprietary technology. We're doing that with patent pending products. And we're doing that with a great community and brand to make it easy for anyone to make their own furniture. So the problem that we're solving was not caused by the pandemic, make no mistake, but it was accelerated by the pandemic. And that problem is that consumers want furniture that is authentically theirs, that they can be proud of, that is different than anything else that's out there in the market today. And DIYing, making your own furniture, is the ultimate way of creating that experience. But there's not an easy way to go do that today, and there's not an easy place to go and get those components to make your own furniture. So we are building that. We are building a trusted market, a trusted company, and a trusted brand with a great user experience online, with personalized product delivered in days, not weeks or months, that's easy to order, and it's all run by a proprietary tech platform that we had to build to be able to do this. Did you know that people in the US alone spend half a trillion dollars to do it themselves today? I didn't until we started looking into this. And I've got a background in DIY, which we'll get to when we talk about our team. And they're doing that for a variety of reasons, but ultimately it shows the desire for people to create their own things. And yet there's no place for you to go if you wanna make your own furniture. We know where to go if we wanna fix something up in our house. We go to a DIY store, that's what we think of. We know where to go if we're trying to create some sort of hobby in crafting or textiles or sewing, but we don't yet have a place to go and that's what we're building with Semi-Exact. What are our products? Well, we started with very simple things. We said, hey, if somebody's building something, they may need table legs and shelf brackets. Let's start with making the hard things to make, the metal goods that make joinery easy, that make furniture structure stable. And so you can go to semiexact.com, and I'd encourage you to go there and take a look at the products that we have available today. We started with just those simple products, and now we're expanding into kitted offerings where you can make things like your own bed or your own outdoor couch. And that makes us different than everything else that's out there in the market today. If you want to get furniture, you can go buy it from a finished goods store like Crate and Barrel or CB2 or West Elm. You can go rent furniture today, and there's a lot of places with big VC money going into the opposite end of the spectrum in this market. And you can get this ready-to-assemble furniture, you can have it gifted to you. But we are the only place that provides that unique experience that you can actually make it your own. And in doing that, we've generated some traction over the past few years. We are on track to do nearly 5 million in revenue this year. We did over a million in the first quarter alone. And our underlying unit economics continue to improve so we can acquire customers profitably. Our margins for products are good and they continue to get better as we scale up product lines. And we will be cash flow positive this year. So let's talk about our customers for a minute. We have two real key types of customers that we've been serving. The first one is actively making furniture. And they've been looking for a trusted place to go with quality products that they can get quickly, that are made on demand, and that are the exact size and colors that they want. That's the customer type that we've been serving over the past couple of years. As we expand, we are focused on the other big market opportunity that's out there, those that are already DIYing. And they have the skill set which increased during the pandemic. There's all sorts of surveys and data out there that show that 90% of millennials did at least one DIY project and they increased their skill set with their tools. That's the market that we're gonna to continue to serve and just provide them with a pathway to get over that fear or ego of making their first thing. And our community is really engaged and they wanna DIY things, but they don't want Ikea. They specifically tell us that. Be careful, do not become Ikea because it will lose the meaning that I have in taking the risk to make something of my own. How do we get those customers? How do we scale up this organization and operation to tell more people about this and get in front of those folks? Well, we've been doing it organically we have a really long tail of products. You can get a 17 inch hairpin leg in mint green from us and there's not a lot of places that you can go get that. And so we win in search on those key long tail terms. We also do really well with search engine marketing through email and advertising where we generate between 400 
an 800% return on our ad spend. Again, we can acquire customers profitably. As we grow, I'm gonna dive into this in a moment, there's a lot more opportunity with social media marketing and influencer marketing and content to create that community. We actually have three of the most influential DIY furniture investors, excuse me, influencers that have invested in our company. And those folks collectively have a 20 million monthly impression tribe that they talk to on a weekly basis. And so we work with them this is Ben Uyeda. We develop products with him. And then we put design patents around those products so they're proprietary to us. We get feedback from the market. Ben creates content that is top of funnel. So if you search for a platform bed or how to make one, you'll find it. And then you can come to us to get those products. It's a really low cost way to launch. And it's a great way to continue to generate evergreen content that helps us to scale our customer acquisition engine. And in doing that, even with relatively few products to date, we still have 23% repeat customer rate, and that continues to grow as we add more products and make it easier to make your own furniture. We have a relatively small for e-commerce return rate at only 2%. So people get what they want, they like it, and then they go tell other people about that. And we have a wonderful net promoter score at 66. And our LTV CAC ratios, if you're in e you know that's really important, are really strong and continuing to grow at 9x last quarter. How big can this get? Well, we're at the emergence of two big markets, right? There's this furniture market globally that is out there that is hundreds of billions of dollars. And there's the DIY market, which the US is extremely mature in. And so if we just focus on the customer types that we know how to go get and we've been serving, add product, expand that out, then we can go get 5 million this year and scale that up to 100 million within the first five years of, uh, of growth. How do we do that? Well, we have two pieces here that are really secret sauce. One is we operate our own factory. It's 25,000 square feet. We'd invite you to all come check it out. It's up in Minden, Nevada. And we stood it up at the beginning of the pandemic. What a run. What makes this so great, though, is that we can actually take new ideas, put them into prototyping, scale them up to a point that we know there's going to be traction, and then we can outsource the manufacturing to other folks so we don't have to constantly scale into CapEx. That's a big piece of the puzzle for how we go from 10 to 100 million over the next few years. The other piece of the puzzle that's secret sauce for us is the factory itself is recompetitive reconfigurable manufacturing system, okay? So we don't have dedicated lines that run and it's only gonna run this product. We have tools and manufacturing equipment that give the ability for us to create all sorts of different types of products and bring those to market very quickly. You can't do that when you're trying to import product and you carry 75,000 SKUs like we do. It makes it hard to get into the game. The other piece of the puzzle for us is that we have a proprietary tech system because there's not a lot of things that take an e-commerce order that's personalized in a certain size and bring it directly into production on the floor of a factory and then get it out to a customer within days. We had to build it ourselves and it's one of the things that allows us to do what we do. So in wrapping this up, where are we headed? Well, this year we're gonna be focused on selling hard goods and creating more digital assets and recurring revenue streams. Tutorials, plans, and online experiences are all things that we know how to monetize for this market as we create a community. And as we move forward in building that out and scaling more products, then we'll raise a series A down the road to be able to rapidly scale up the customer acquisition engine that we've talked about building this year. I have a wonderful team that I'm fortunate to be part of. Uh, I mentioned I have a background in a variety of different things. One of those that's particular to this is I was with a company called Interline Brands as a director there. Uh, had a team that was a resident expert on the housing market and DIY. That company eventually sold to Home Depot for over a billion dollars. Matt, my great friend and co-founder, we've known each other for over a decade. He's a true maker and has spent his life building organizations and communities and teams and understands manufacturing and engineering. One other key highlight here in our team is Chris Yount, a board member that we are so excited to have on board because he has both buy side and sell side M&A experience. 
Our projections were planned to grow, continued between 40 and 60% over the years ahead. And our round is 600K as a bridge that we have over half of it already circled up. The last few seconds here is that we have a very clear path to an exit. And there's a variety of different company types that will love something like this, whether that be in the furniture industry, whether that be in DIY, or whether that's somebody that's looking for an e-com company. Thanks so much for your time today. And we invite you to invest with some exact. Thanks, Elton. And when I said competitive, I didn't mean competing with each other who, for who has the best, best jokes. Um, I meant clearly they're all doing the same thing. Um, so um, thanks again, Elton. Next up, um, Dr. George Gluck from Surgistream. George, come on up. Okay, thank you for the introduction. All right, so I'm Dr. George Gluck and I'm here representing uh, Surgistream. Surgistream is a SaaS company that specializes in surgical logistics, which includes case, case scheduling and surgical implant delivery. This is a very uh, specialized market, so I think it's important to spend a little bit of time understanding why this is a problem. And this slide really demonstrates the complexities of surgical scheduling when it comes to communication. And our platform specifically focuses on the facility doctor, their assistant, the ven and the vendor. And there's a lot of back and forth communication that occurs to set up just one singular surgical case. And that can be multiple communications, even within 12 to 24 hours of that surgery happening. And a lot of this happens in the background when people are just waiting and nervous about their surgery. And it's a problem because there's no standardized way to do this. And these include multiple different communication silos. And what you get is disorganized, inefficient communication without a standard platform, like what we're used to when you order a car for an Uber, or you order a product like Amazon, or you order customized furniture from semi-exact whatever it is, but there's, this is what it looks like. It's these back and forth text messages between different people. And then on the right, on, on the vendor side, the device distributor, the people that give these surgical implants to be used in surgeries, this is what's happening on the ground level. You have these whiteboards with magnets tracking millions of dollars in inventory. And everyone's just piecing together the best they can, their system. That whiteboard was in California. This whiteboard on the left is in New England with magnets managing inventory again. You have these calendar workarounds with repeating daily events representing where all the inventory is. Uh, these companies have larger platforms that manage the inventory on a corporate level, but this is what's actually happening on the ground level in 2022. And on the right, this would be in a, a doctor's practice. You have these, these pieces of paper that have orders that get submitted. They're not digitized, they're not tracked, there's no transparency, and everyone just kind of puts things in place and we hope that they come together and Things work out the way they're supposed to most of the time, but they're problems and they present significant patient safety issues. Now, the communication part is a little bit concerning and challenging, but it's also not just that, it's what happens to those implants. So I talk about vendor trays and implants. This is a vendor tray. It's like a large metal shoebox type device. It's got implants that could actually used in surgery. These often get brought to the hospital in the trunk of someone's car or in a courier van. Sometimes they're on the shelf at the facility, but sometimes they need to be brought there. It needs to be dropped off at the right time. It needs to be processed sterilely, and this takes hours. And then it gets put on a big shelf with a bunch of other uh, blue trays waiting for surgery. And then someone else comes in and pulls that and brings that to the surgery room outside of the room without actually, this, while waiting for the surgery to happen. Then when the surgery actually comes along, an OR tech, a different person comes along, has to grab the right material, bring it into the OR room and open it. This is a lot that has to happen. And if you're familiar with the Swiss cheese theory, it's a lot to, to rely on and at some point these holes are going to line up and there's going to be an error there's going to be a mistake fortunately these don't happen often and they really should be never events but when they do happen you have someone with an injury like this who's told in the morning i'm sorry you have to fast the rest of the day because we can't get your case ready till later in the evening or it's in the afternoon and you tell them i'm sorry you have to spend one extra day in the hospital because we have to wait for your surgery in the morning now it had to be canceled or we tell you to go home and come back at the end of the week when we have another operative time available with that particular surgeon so again, these are not common events, but they do happen. And to quote a, a local surgery center manager here, they spend 95% of their manpower to keep this miss rate down to about three to 5%. So that's a lot of human resources to put into this process. There really should be much more automated and to have a much more standardized way to do things. And that's where Surgistream comes into play. And that's the, the problem we're addressing because everyone has many different ways to do things. And how do you you had a piece of software to fit in with all these different methods to bring people together and break down these communication silos. 
And that's what Surge Stream is. It's real-time communication and scheduling. And these, these simple images are from our actual platform, which has been beta tested in Las Vegas and a couple other states for over two years now. We process nearly 10,000 surgical cases. We have 200 users on this platform and it's being used today and it's making things much more efficient. So what makes our platform so unique from other things that are out there? These are some of our competitors around the outer borders here. And they generally tend to focus on one of these key stakeholders in this process, whether it's the surgeon in their clinic or the vendor and the device manufacturer or the surgical facility. And that's a big problem because you want everyone together on the same platform and it's, it's virtually impossible. So you have to create a platform that caters to each of these stakeholders. Now, by doing that, you also create multiple revenue streams because we have a subscription model for the surgeons and their clinics with unlimited users within their clinic, pre-surgical checklists, imaging management. It's not an electronic health record, but it complements the electronic health record. And then you also have the vendors and device manufacturers. You can create, we have tools in place with our subscription model to bring those teams together, but then we also have subscription upgrades to allow for digital product management on the fly. And then you also have the surgical facilities where it's not just a surgical scheduler that has access to their subscription platform on SurgeStream, but you can give HIPAA compliant access to anyone in the operating room on their mobile device to see real-time case changes. When the surgeon makes a, a unique request on the fly or product changes or case time changes, they get push notifications and real-time real data, which is what you need to make things happen. Uh, and this is just a feature overview slide showing again how we try and bring value to each of these stakeholders, but the competition falls short in addressing this whole process and seeing the entire life cycle of a surgical case through from beginning to end. This slide represents phase two of our platform. Phase one is, is simple to understand. It's a subscription model. We provide value. We're filling a need that doesn't exist to really bring people together. But you can actually monetize the surgical schedule because this is a highly highly targeted platform. And you can target surgeons when they're considering their needs right when they're about to perform a surgery or right when it's coming up in that week. And that's the best time to bring information to that surgeon, whether it's product-based or academic-based. And that market is substantial, $40 billion globally. This represents orthopedic device sales, not other subspecialties. This is just orthopedics, 25 billion in the US, $8 billion uh, as a obtainable market, about 30%. And one to $2 billion of that revenue is put towards marketing and sales because orthopedic surgeons and other subspecialty surgeons are high long-term value customers. And a lot of these device manufacturers have similar devices. And so they're competing to edge out each other and bring in the orthopedic surgeon to, to adapt the product and use it long-term with their, with their surgeries. So our business model has this phase two component that monetizes the surgical schedule, but really the simple subscription model where we already have traction, this phase one represents nearly $100 million just in the orthopedic surgeon alone and device and the vendor within the US. And this does not include the facility side, which is 5,000 uh, ambulatory surgery centers and approximately 5,000 hospitals in the US. Uh, our leadership team has over 30 years of industry experience on both the device manufacturer side and the clinical side. Our CTO is an equity partner and he manages our engineers. He's been with us since the company's inception. Uh, he has extensive enterprise software experience in developing EHRs and worked with government and large commercial entities. Our VP of Business Development uh, has a lifetime's experience of enterprise data solution sales and software sales, and he's overseen multiple exits and closed multiple large enterprise deals as well, and he's also a startup MV mentor. Uh, we're nearing the end of beta testing since we launched our beta platform initially at the end of 2019. Uh, we went through the UCLA Anderson Accelerator last spring and subsequently entered into two pilot agreements with two large device manufacturers represent over $2.2 billion in annual sales that are moving towards a direct sales model, not just within the US, but also in Germany and the UK. And we do have an international patent protection for our software. Uh, we've raised over $800,000 thus far. And this year we're really excited because we're rolling out our our formal subscription platform, and we're hoping to close two of our enterprise deals which represent approximately $1 million in revenue. We're seeking an additional million dollars in seed investment to close around use of funds predominantly for engineering, but also to push forward with our go-to-market strategy and bring on a sales team uh, marketing strategy and to customize some of our pilot programs further that we've been doing with these uh, device manufacturers as well. This is a breakdown of uh, that funding with at least a 15 to 18 month runway. 
And uh, the most notable thing here is our maintenance burn rate is, is really only about $6,000 for server costs and, and incremental monthly updates. So we can run pretty lean if we need to. Uh, exit strategy, we're looking at about a, a, a five-year time horizon. There are multiple opportunities here uh, for an exit. We can be acquired by a large electronic health record company like an Epic or a Cerner. These are name brands within the industry that are likely looking for lateral moves and could potentially be looking to acquire a vendor gateway for themselves. Uh, Google and Meta actually are potential big data plays with our phase two uh, uh, business model. Uh, Amazon also is venturing into healthcare with Amazon Care and being experts in logistics, that would be a natural play for them. And there are some ASC management companies, some of whom we've uh, been in talks with that actually don't have vendor coordination, vendor gateway platforms because they haven't broken down the HIPAA compliance and been able to remove patient data with their foundation platform, which is meant to be internal. So that's a potential uh, acquisition opportunity. And there's also an IPO opportunity as we move into our second phase as well with monetization of the surgical schedule. Thank you. Thank you, George. Awesome presentation. All right, we're down to our last presenter, David Knight from Turbine. So David, come on up. Okay, since I'm the guy keeping you from drinks out there, I'll be fast and it'll be fun. But first, audience participation. How many people in the room own an electric vehicle? How many of them are a Tesla? Pretty good. How many have been in an electric vehicle if you don't own one? Aha. So guess what? Electric vehicles are happening. And I'm gonna show you exactly uh, what that means and why we've created a company to solve some real problems in the EV space that are happening right now. But first, I'm gonna brag about our team. Um, we are a company that moved from San Francisco where we got started. We were actually incubated under the Alchemist Accelerator, which is a bunch of Stanford professors. And uh, I have a long experience in enterprise technology and it says private space flight because in 2004, a group of us created this thing called the X Prize and we actually uh, put up a bunch of money to get people to build spaceships. That, that was really cool to do. My co-founder, Brian Enoch's son, uh, he's a brilliant software architect and designer. And both of us have worked on systems that have to be incredibly reliable, incredibly fast, incredibly scalable in areas like digital media streaming, electronic messaging, and financial transactions. I'm very, very honored and proud to have a killer advisory board. You can just scan those names. Uh, every single one of them puts in a lot of time with Turbine and some have even put quite a bit of cash in on their own. And we're just really excited to have people from the various industries that we're gonna to be touching. So what are we building? Turbine is a digital platform for the management of what's called Internet of Things data. You heard earlier about the IoT. Well, we're focusing on a very specific intersection of mobility, infrastructure, and energy, specifically meaning the electrical grid. We're doing this with a platform that's based on quite a lot of high technology and uses some artificial intelligence. So what are we solving? Well, if you've been in EVs or hang out with people with EVs, everybody has what's called range anxiety. Am I gonna run out of electrons before I get to my next charging point? The other problem which is really happening is that the power utilities are starting to realize that there's gonna be a lot of electric vehicles with a lot of chargers. To give you an idea, a level three Tesla supercharger uses about a third of a megawatt. That's one charger. So if there's 10, do the math. So the electrical utilities need to start doing what's called load balancing. There's also EV charging networks. They actually have a lot of issues that they can't talk to all the chargers that they don't own. And last but not least, a lot of state and local governments are putting in chargers, and those are not part of any network either. So we're going to bring all that together with a very simple idea. We're going to federate all of those things into one common data system. Nobody's doing this yet. We're going to do this in a way that can make money for everybody through revenue sharing. We're also going to be able to get money from the utilities by providing them data they have no other way to get. And very importantly for investors, we're gonna build up the value of this company till we can get to a really strong exit, either through a public offering or being acquired by a very large company. So let me just kind of roll through these issues. If you guys know Teslas, most Tesla people don't really have a charging anxiety problem most of the time because the cars 
talk to the Tesla cloud. The cloud talks to the chargers. They know where they are on the earth. They know what they're doing. It works really well. The problem is, as I'm gonna show you in a second, there's way more cars coming on the market than Tesla's. It's, it's kind of stunning. So there are people who have been wanting to buy a different EV, but they still go to the Tesla because Tesla has a better charging experience, which is would be like saying, I'm gonna buy the Mercedes because they have a Chevron station attached to it. it it's kind of wild that this is what's happening. So we're gonna to try to fix all of that problem. This is an amazing chart showing you the status of the industry right now. And this chart is only North America, but this is happening all over the world. There are 3,300 power utilities in North America. They're all regional, they own their little fiefdoms. The one here of course is Envy Energy. There are over 240 new EV models coming on the market just this year and next year. It is staggering. And lots and lots of charging stations the federal government under the infrastructure bill, this is the one that's already passed, not the one they're still fighting over, is gonna put in a half a million new chargers. So here's a really fun chart. 10 years ago, there were two global manufacturers making EVs. Today, that's the chart. It is staggering. They're making things from little city cars all the way up to semi trucks. And yes, we're gonna have electric big rigs on the roads from the big manufacturers. Now this is really fun because we're in Vegas, I decided to make something like a slot machine. Um, this could run literally for five minutes. I'm not going to do that, but it is insane how many new EV models are on the market now. And this stops only about a year and a half from now. If you go even farther out, there's going to be hundreds more. And these are individual models of cars that you're going to be able to buy or can already buy. Um, I won't tell you which ones I think are really cool. So then on the charging side, you've got several charging networks in the United States, EVgo, ChargePoint, and Electrify America, plus Tesla. But you also have lots and lots of private stations. Um, this is the building I live in. We actually have chargers in our building. They're also at things like pizza places and Starbucks is starting to put them in. They're really becoming pervasive. And then you've got all the ones that the cities, counties, and states are putting in. In fact, the city of Vegas is putting in charging stations. So what do you do about that? Well, none of these things talk to each other at any kind of a scale at all. So we're gonna use a lot of technology to bring them together it's not a data communications problem, it's a data management problem. So what we built is a platform that runs in the cloud and is capable of handling all the stuff that nobody likes to talk about, regulatory compliance in different jurisdictions, rights management, policies that control what data can go where under what circumstances and when. We also have the ability to monetize the financial transactions going between different parties. And very importantly, we can actually have well, taxes. There's a lot of states now worried about the declination and fuel tax as more EVs come online, and we'll be able to introduce with them an electron tax. And we have three states talking to us right now about that. So let me motor ahead. So why bring in the utilities? A lot of people, even Tesla owners ask that. Well, it turns out utilities have been their own, like I said, fiefdoms. Here come the electric cars. These power stations use a staggering amount of current, like I said. So the only way to fix the problem is to help the grid load balance. So without getting into the whole technology of load balancing, because it gets really deep, the electrical grid is real time. Gasoline is not. I can keep a cup of gasoline until I need it. I can't do that with power. There are batteries showing up in homes, not at the scale of the grid, and it'll be a really long time. So by bringing the power utilities into the conversation, we can help them to load balance. In California right now, they're actually getting worried about brownouts being caused by so many chargers. There's actually a lot of articles about that. Up next, this is, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. This is the charging tech stack. There's a lot of pieces to it, uh, all the way from how the car talks to the charger unit over the cable, all the way up to people using the batteries in their big battery EVs to put power back in the grid. That's about to be a thing. GM and Ford are both releasing their electric pickups. They have such big batteries, you could run a house for days just off the charge, and you could put power back into the grid. This is an eye chart. <laughs> this is what we're, we've built in the middle. The middle is the turbine part. Everything around it are us talking to all these different factions, the grid, the chargers, the charging networks, and the vehicle companies. The good news is we don't have to connect to individual cars. That would take forever. All the new cars have bi-directional data transceivers, 
which means that they're already talking to say the General Motors cloud, the BMW cloud, et cetera. We just have to make the one connection to each manufacturer's cloud. And all the fleet guys like Hertz, Hertz, by the way, is buying 200,000 EVs, 200,000. Uh, half are Teslas, a bunch are from a spin out of Volvo, and then the rest are Ford. And these are all great potential allies and customers for us, which brings me to revenue. So we have three revenue streams. Uh, I should point out that we just built all of this basic system and now we're in a pilot, which I'll show you in a second. Um, we're now, we have a company with a great team. We have the product built. Now we're gonna make it into a business. So why I'm standing here right now is we're right on the cusp of taking this to the market. So transaction revenue, as we build this up, we'll get a little tithing for every charging session that we enable. We're gonna be behind the scenes. We're not trying to get between a charging network or a car company and their customer. They would hate that. So we're behind the scenes, sort of like an Intel inside where the turbine link network is talking into the backs of all their systems. And when we do facilitate a transaction, we get a fee. The next one is subscriptions. We realize the power utilities aren't doing transactions, but they do need the data to load balance. So we're gonna charge sort of a all you can eat data feed that has tons of real-time data coming at the utility. We'll also get utility data back to us and we'll charge them for that on a monthly basis. And then there are some factions, including uh, Porsche, for example, said, now we're gonna make our own charging system. I don't know if that's too late, but they're doing it. And those are the kind of companies that would actually license our platform. So I'm gonna wrap it up. We have calculated the TAM with this eye chart. Um, I know I'm running out of time. We are also doing a lot of things that will help with sustainability. And you, this slide deck's online, by the way, if you wanna take a look at it. So where are we? We're doing a POC right here in Las Vegas with the city. We actually have our code already running on servers that belong to the city. We're, in, we're entering the second phase of a four phase approach. Each phase correlates to a funding milestone. And then last but not least, the company. So we have uh, a good team here based in Las Vegas. We have a nice uh, strong idea of how the revenue is gonna work. It does form a hockey stick. We've raised approximately 4 million in total so far uh, between uh, us and a bunch of great angel and family offices. We're raising 750K as a bridge right now. Uh, I think about half of that is filled up. And we're very proud to have as many Nevada investors as possible. In fact, Fund NV is leading this bridge round. So with that basically being said, it's time for this to show up on the market. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, David. And thank you to all of our uh, founders. Great set of presentations. And um, so it's gonna be really hard um, for our investor group uh, at, at what's coming next. A, uh, at some point up here, there's gonna be a QR code uh, that's gonna be put up here and that, uh, there it is. Uh, we're gonna, we'd like to, we, we wanna do a uh, sort of an audience choice. Now it's not, there's no, there's no uh, money attached to that one. But, uh, but uh, and I have no idea whether the audience choice will line up with the investor choice or not, but it'll be some fun. So, uh, so everybody uh, get on, get your QR code uh, reader out there and, uh, and vote, your, vote for, your, for your heart. Now what's gonna happen for the rest of us, for the rest of us, those of, those of us who are investors, is we're gonna go out the door, we're gonna go down the stairs and we're gonna kind of turn left at the bottom of the stairs. You'll see a bunch of glass doors in front of you. Go down the hall it to uh, room number three. Uh, we're gonna gather there and we are going to vote. Um, and our other investors who are not physically in the room with us will join us on a private Zoom uh, session that you've already got from Maggie.